All right, so uh, here we are in this special Valentine's Day with the consciousness icon, Mr. Ken Wilbur, a man that since 1986 has created and developed the most advanced and complete operating system to understand ourselves, our lives, and all that there is, his integral theory. A theory that many, including myself, see as a real theory of everything. So hello, Ken. Thank you for offering us this opportunity in the official day of love. I want to celebrate it with you by making you an interview that, as you know, has been prepared by integralists from all over the world. But by the way, explicitly have told me to send you their greetings and appreciations from Argentina to Russia, Spain, and England, just to name a few. So, how are you, Ken? Welcome. Well, I'm fine. Delighted to be here and very much looking forward to it. Very nice. So, we have less mm, questions this year than last year, because last year, which has been a real success, because uh, we have like uh, 7,000 views in, in the uh, recording that we made last year. So there are people which are interested to hear and listen to you. What do you have to say about right. the questions they ask? Uh, so it's kind of spread out. So let's hope this also uh, this year uh, does the same uh the same sensation you know creates the same sensation that people reads it and listens to it but they said that it was too long because it was 20 questions and we took kind of like three hours and a half almost four hours so right. let's see if we can shorten it a little bit in the right. answers and i have also reduced the questions so we have instead of 20 so that not to disturb you so much let's make only 13 questions i have for you okay. today Alrighty. Yeah. so let's start with the first can that says what shock humanity should receive and suffer before recognizing and acting upon the fact that there are still people who die from lack of food and medicines or even drinking water. And what exactly was the question? The question is, what shock humanity should receive? What would it be needed to happen horrible, you know, to shake humanity and then before recognizing and acting upon the fact that there are still people who die from lack of food and medicines or even drinking water what do you think that it will have to happen to humanity because you know everything many things have happened including the pandemic and everything and it people thought that the pandemic was going to kind of open up very much the consciousness of people and it seems that it's not doing so. So what do you think that it should happen to humanity? What good, horrible thing should happen so that we kind of wake up? Right. Well, any sort of traumatic shock, I mean, a serious traumatic shock can have that effect on humans we would have thought that the global pandemic would have done so and in a certain sense it did in a certain sense it left people feeling very vulnerable and particularly the first year when it came through and hit a lot of people and that was very very upsetting Mm -hmm. And many of us don't remember quite what that first year was like, but it was very traumatic. And people were, you know, wouldn't go outside. They weren't allowed to congregate. They weren't allowed to go to church. They weren't allowed to go to the movies. 
they weren't allowed to have parties together. They weren't even allowed to go in the hospitals and say goodbye to their loved ones who were dying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to get much more shocking than all of those put together. And that offered a truly genuine global shock. And in terms of what, if that didn't have a long lasting effect, then what could be worse than that? I don't know. I mean, obviously you can just make up horrible events such as um, it, the Earth getting hit by an asteroid, um, some uh, traumatic effect like that. Um, or the out of space people coming down and saying, right. we're here. <laughs> right. So, I mean, those sorts of things, you can just come up with list after list of outrageous um, implications of all sorts of really bad events. Um, I still think the first year of COVID, when you add when you really look back on that and remember all the things that we were forced to do, like I say, I mean, not even being able to go and say goodbye to your people dying in the hospital, that was just horrid. Yes, yes. Uh, not being able to assemble in church, not being able to go to school. There was a complete shutdown on that not being able to gather in groups, not being able to go outside in any sort of large numbers. Keys um, and embrace as well, nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty bad. Um, so what humanity needs, Ken, what humanity needs, what, why, what is the reason why do you think that we don't get it? Why don't we get this waking up call? Yeah, I don't know. Um, in part, it's just human resiliency. Just we can put up with most anything. And the fact that we put up with the first year of COVID I mean that we agreed, okay, I won't go to church. Or we agreed, okay, well, I won't go to school. And we agreed to all of these catastrophes and managed to just put up with them. So you can think of even worse tragedies. It kind of be hard to, I mean, what's worse than shutting down the economy entirely, not being able to go to work, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to church, not being able to have Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, this is about as bad as you can get. And yet human beings would just manage to suck it up and push through it and manage to survive. So you can think of more horrible things. It's kind of hard to imagine stuff more horrible than that first year of COVID. I mean, what's more horrible than not being able to assemble? not being able to go to church, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to Thanksgiving dinner, not being able to see your loved ones as they're dying in a hospital. I mean, you can sort of think of things that are worse than that, 
by making each of those even more extreme. But the fact is, we managed to survive that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the real testimony from that shock is the utter resilience of human beings being able to endure all of those insults and still move on move but forward. but what about what about this openness to something uh, some mode of higher feelings of higher thoughts of elevation of consciousness you know this raising up you know this consciousness why why doesn't it human beings you know get as a whole i would say because you always say that their people starts in level one that's for sure and and they will have to go through it that's for sure i understand but i mean the wholeness of let's say the people over over 30 i don't know you know people that may really as a whole make a change why don't all of a sudden we recognize that it's about time that we human beings instead of keeping up making wars for example like the one we have in ukraine now and russia right. you know why don't we already overcome all that and and really see it as a whole i mean uh, uh, the biggest part the majority of humanity see it to be able to then pull the others right well i think in fact some of them did but not a whole large number but some people did overcome these and they did it by finding their own larger wholeness. And the reason more people don't do that is that most people are nowhere near close to having a wholeness in their own being. So if we look at waking up or growing up or cleaning up or sh showing up very few people are a long way along any one of those areas very few people have waken up very few people have grown up very it's few true. people have clean up very few people show up mm -hmm. and so because of that simply tossing them into some terribly straining and stressful situations they don't have the inner ability to overcome those and that's part of the problem of having more people be integral in their approach if all of humanity was integral we would have met the covid crisis with an entirely different attitude and we would have come out of that even more fortified in our wholeness yeah but it's that lack of wholeness in humans as a population that is so problematic and that's why we want to of course get the integral message out so that people can more adequately adjust to these kinds of calamities um, and for people that are 
nearly whole or approaching wholeness, what's something like those calamities do is help you continue your growth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they give you a chance to really check it out and move forward in this growth process if you're fairly close to wholeness then you can move more towards wholeness mm -hmm. and if you're not well, you're just gonna suffer among all of those fragmented pieces. That's it. And that's what most of humanity did. And mm. it was a shame. Mm. A great suffering, absolutely. Great suffering. And more that is going, going to come because of all the economic crisis which is gonna bring and is bringing and everything. So anyway, so how, would how do you how would you see to achieve that democracy in all nations would be at the real service of citizens how would that be and not at the service of the powerful world organizations how would i see what how would you see this uh how to achieve this uh, possibility how would you think that democracy would be uh, of real service in all nations to citizens instead of being now serving the powerful world organizations how yeah. would you think that that could be achieved yeah well it could be achieved in part through education I mean, education say that again education education oh yeah because what we need what we're teaching students now is barely education it's usually some sort of indoctrination some sort of political endeavor um it's not really you don't even study genuine history anymore it's true um, and so it's just become sort of um, a polarized politicized weaponized indoctrination and that's terrible Mm -hmm. I mean, what a real education should be is, first of all, truly studying all of the standard courses, history, psychology, sociology, and, and psychology. Yeah. so on. But then it would also be set in, here's how you can grow. After all, part of what you want from education is to learn how to grow. And that means to learn how to become whole. And that means learning how to grow up, wake up, show up, open up, and clean up. Absolutely. Because those are the ways that open human beings to wholeness to greater wholeness. That's and true. so if that's what we got out of education and people graduated through education with a real understanding of their own wholeness and what it meant and how to apply it and how to use it and how to recognize it, that would be an entirely new approach. Absolutely. And under those circumstances, these types of calamities that occur, people would have tools that they could engage to use to handle these problems. And that would be 
amazing. And then the real democracy could be on the service of people and citizens, like we say. Right, exactly. And that would be an amazing event. Let's hope that it really comes some, sometime, somehow. Right. Because we know that each of these areas, waking up, growing up, cleaning up, opening up, showing up, we know the evidence for each of those is overwhelming. I mean, we have actual data from people who have undergone these various growth processes. And there's no doubt that all of them are real and all of them occur and all of them can be engaged. Mm -hmm. And that is a genuine truth. Mm -hmm. And so they are engaged in something that has real results and a real effect on their lives. Absolutely. And they can check it out themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. never asked anybody. These aren't just belief systems. These aren't just abstract philosophical structures. Mm -hmm. These are real practices that people can do to engage in energizing their own wholeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the stages are laid out very clearly for each of these types of wholeness. And they generally will go through anywhere from five to nine stages. And at each of those stages, you can feel an increasing amount of wholeness. It's per perfectly obvious. And so when that's happening, then you know that you're on to something because it's your own direct immediate experience that's getting involved. And so this isn't um just some highfalutin metaphysical abstractions yeah i i tell the same thing to my people in consultation i say don't believe me just practice it and you'll see right <laughs> because it's you will get the results of applying it right. so the the thing is that you know, I don't, in general, I do not believe that people is very much like ready or, you know, prone to practice at all. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, here we are, you know, like kind of uh, very uh, relaxed and, and the laziness is what it's driving in general, the everyday life, laziness because there is no desire for and curiosity for learning more, knowing more, and then therefore practicing more to see the results. That's true. They want the results without any practice, which is a very childish way of seeing life. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so funny. <laughs> So anyway, let's see. The third question we have is, how do you envision the transition from fossil to clean energies? Do you think it that is in, do you think, do you see it as an important matter, fossil, that transition from fossil to clean energy? Yeah, well, that's a very complex topic. First of all, well, I'll take it in several parts. The move to green energy 
is not without problems. So among other things, the size of land required to instigate clean energy, such as solar and wind, is really quite huge. If we wanted to set up wind farms and solar farms that would cover all of the needs of the energy of the United States, it would take up about a third of the United States. It would take up all of California and all the way into Texas. So that's a problem. We also have the problem that they're intermittent energies, which means they need some sort of battery power. Yeah. But we don't, we're nowhere near having the size and capacities and batteries that will allow us to do that. Um, right now, the amount of you take all the solar batteries in the United States, all the energy in them, they've got enough to last 17 minutes in terms of taking care of all the energy that the United States needs. Oh my God. So it's not looking terribly good. No. The other thing that I'll say is, I'm involved with some people that are working on absolutely revolutionary approaches to hydrocarbon fuel, fossil fuels. And we have already cracked the difficult portion of being able to extract fossil fuels without any emissions. And we can convert them into types of fuels that don't emit any CO2 at all. Uh -huh. So that means we would be able to use our excess of fossil fuel, but without emitting any CO2. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's being put in place now and we think that within 18 months it'll be widely available to anybody who wants to use it all right so that would put an end to the nastiness of fossil fuels mm -hmm. so and then it would good news us from having to get into the difficulties of renewables, which are truly problematic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I, whenever I think about fossil fuel to renewables, I have to think about both of those aspects of them, both the difficulty in renewables the land they take and so on. And the fact that we have now a technology that can utilize fossil fuels without any emissions at all. And so that to me seems to, if both of those hold true, that would definitely be um, a solution to that problem. And you so say I, that will be in 18 months? Goodness, you, you put it very early. 18, 18 months, mm -hmm. we think, before, I mean, we're already, the fossil fuel technology is already working. We can already take small, um, machines 
and convert fossil fuel without creating any emissions. So what we're doing now is just learning how to put these small machines together to create large output machines. Mm -hmm. And that's what we think we'll have ready within 18 months. And this is already being done in conversion with Texas A&M. So it's being hooked up to very real, very respectable, large entities that are supporting this entirely. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we feel, and, and they are agreed, you've got it, this thing works. And mm -hmm. you're going to make a fortune. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a possibility that I'll be a billionaire. Yay! <laughs> yeah. But uh, quite aside from how much money it makes, it's definitely working. And well, when you are a billionaire, then you will create by clear truth the inst integral institute with a big right. building and everything <laughs> right. that's right we'll we'll all go there <laughs> yeah very good that will be fine hey that's i i will look up to that okay <laughs> so which is the most obscure aspect of your being that with which you've had the most difficulty to recognize and accept. So the most obscure aspect of my being, my being, myself. Um, <laughs> that with which you have had a great difficulty to kind of, you know, bear with. I would say probably cleaning up, which is the use of techniques to attempt to unify your shadow elements. Mm -hmm. um, and so you call that in just one word disintegration? Well, you could. Um, that's how shadow elements are created, is by disidentifying with. And they're difficult because there are so many defense mechanisms that you use when you split off or disidentify some shadow element. Um, and those defense mechanisms are very strong. They're really deep seated and they def definitely take a while to get at. Mm -hmm. And it can be done for sure. And I've made, I think, an enormous amount of progress in doing that. But it still, I would say, the hardest thing to do simply because, and it's also like, let's say you get mad at somebody for being arrogant. And if you're really reacting to their arrogance and getting angry with it and so on, that almost always means it's some arrogance you have that you're disintegrating, sealing off and projecting onto that person. And so being able to, first of all, acknowledge that that arrogance that you just 
hate in that person. They're so obnoxious and <laughs> arrogant and overbearing and ugh. And you have to admit that's you. Yeah. And that's the hard part. And you have to then identify with it, reown it, bring it back in. And then when you do that, you and you actually manage to reintegrate it, then that other person's arrogance will stop to bother you. It won't bother you as much right. because you realize it's yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but getting over that little hump of everything I hate and despise out there is something I first hated and despised in myself. And therefore, yikes, it's the whole world is opened up to your shadow material. Mm -hmm. And so taking it sort of one at a time, you can work through it. But it's very hard to realize that all those things that you hate and despise in the world are those things that you first hated and despised in yourself. And that's why you split them off and projected them. And Would so it's- That in your case was arrogance? That were. Would you say that in your case was arrogance? Some, sure. Um, some of it, it can be almost anything that you dislike strongly in other people. It can be arrogance, it can be conceitedness, it can be um, aggressiveness, it can be meanness, but you're not going to despise them in another person unless you first despise them in yourself. Because not everybody reacts negatively to the person that has arrogance, for example. But you're going, the only person that's going to react negatively to an arrogant person is somebody who's got a bit of arrogance themselves, but they're not aware of it. They're splitting it off and pushing it out of consciousness and therefore they project it. Mm -hmm. And so that's always the tip away is mm -hmm. well, why is this person upsetting you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you might get a new job, let's say, and you have a boss and all of a sudden you just can't you find you just can't stand this boss because he's so controlling and he's so over controlling and so you start to almost hate your boss but you notice that not everybody in the company hates the boss now, the boss could, in fact, be very over controlling. But it's only when you project your own over controlling qualities onto your boss that you start to hate him. Because now you're suffering from two sets of over controlling qualities his plus yours. <laughs> and it's that double dose of over controlling that's yeah. driving you nuts. Yeah. But again, not everybody feels this way. So why do you? Yeah. Because you have taken some aspect of yourself, split it off, and projected them onto your boss. Mm -hmm. If you accepted the over controlling, qualities in your own self, you wouldn't mind them in him. It's only when you despise them in yourself and project them that you start to despise them in him.
Mm -hmm. And so, but that, once you see that, it can be difficult acknowledging that part of yourself that's over controlling. After all, you originally hated it and projected it. So on your boss, so when you try to take it back, you still got to deal with this part of you that hates it in yourself. And that yeah. can be very difficult. Very difficult to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I found that that probably of all the different areas, and there are difficulties in each area, waking up, for example, can be a very prolonged um and difficult in a sense realization if you take let's say zen buddhism which is a way of waking up enlightenment satori if you practice that it usually takes two to three years of intense practice before you'll have a satori so that can be difficult, but I've managed to handle those difficulties and they worked out fine. And I feel very comfortable with the waking up part of me now. Um, growing up can be difficult because you're moving from archaic to magic, to mythic, to rational, to pluralistic, to integral stages. And if you've had a fairly good upbringing, you generally can get to around the rational stage of development. But then moving into pluralistic can be very difficult, particularly because you might really dislike what some of the pluralistic philosophies are like. Mm -hmm. So you get very much um, a whole sort of woke philosophy and political correctness and all of those things. And they're hard to like. And so you have to just realize that they are overblown and exaggerated forms and then grow into that pluralistic understanding. And then moving beyond pluralistic into integral can be tough um, because pluralistic really gets centered on the fact that there are multiple truths and you want to acknowledge all of them but then integral finds ways to bring them together into unified wholes and that can be a little bit of a difficult step but it's usually can be done um and i'm very happy with how i've done on that part um, <laughs> sure <laughs> i so, would say that's the most significant in you as well <laughs> yeah i um, would say so i i but uh, um cleaning up is I'm happy with how it's gone, but it's still difficult. And I still have to work on that in an almost daily way. Because what it really means is all of those things out there that you dislike or despise are something that you first dislike and despised in yourself right or you wouldn't be reacting to them that's it that's it and that's, that's everyday work absolutely yeah. from 
all of us, don't we all need yeah. to work that daily? I think until the very day we die. <laughs> I think it's the cleaning up is it's like like for example sweeping the floor. You know, we right. have to keep on doing it every day. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's necessary, absolutely. So Ken, are you surprised by the high level of conspiracy beliefs and anti-vaccine anti activists. Many say that we are in the midst of a socio-anthropological experiment orchestrated by just a powerful lobby. So what do you take on this? Of things like Antifa? Uh, you know, the conspiracy beliefs and the anti-vaccines anti activists. There are so many in the world right now. It's a lot of population saying that all that has happened, you know, that with the COVID and everything is just like a manipulation and that we are being uh, like cobaya mice. <laughs> that we they are experimenting with us so what do you, what is your take on this what do you think about these anti vaccines people and conspiracy theory people that say that we are in an anthropological and sociological experiment we are in the midst of that what do you think right. about that? And, and what exactly is the experiment experiment on you know an anthropological that like experiment on medical or or uh like on the contrary as well maybe sociological and psychological experiments and anthropological experiments like let's see how people is manipulated you know let's see how people um is so weak that humanity is going to let themselves be like instilled ideas and, and behaviors and something like that. Therefore, these anti-vaccines people and these activists on the conspiracy theory, that's what they are believing. They are believing that we are just like a mouse of a laboratory, laboratory mice. <laughs> yeah. And is this vaccine meaning the COVID vaccine? Yes, yes. When when I say anti anti vaccines, I mean the people which is against. They are the deniers. They are called. You know, they are called the deniers. At least in Spain, they are called the deniers. Right. Um, well, usually when I want to understand a conspiracy theory. I really want to understand what exactly the people proposing such a theory think is happening. Because usually, well, in general, conspiracy theories don't work. I mean, generally speaking, a conspiracy theory is just a way to look at certain things that are happening and then come up with a sort of paranoid suspicion about why they're really happening. And so they come up with these conspiracy theories that sort of makes sense if you buy the underlying paranoia. So yeah, but it seems that in this case, uh, excuse me to, to cut you off, but in this case, it seems that there are, they say, there are proofs by many doctors and you know biologists and specialists in, in uh, genetics and everything, that they say that the vaccines really do not work as vaccines. They just avoid death, the dead by COVID. 
but they are not vaccines in themselves because they do not avoid to get the COVID, you see, and that on the contrary, they are obliging us, the, the governments and everything, they are obliging us to put them on and then to, to get a certificate to be able to travel from one place to the other just because we are being manipulated. That's what they say, you know, the, yeah. these people. Well, um, in the United States, people over 85 years old, because COVID attacks very old people, and that's primarily it. They don't attract uh, youngsters. They don't attack youngsters. They don't attack. That's not true. In Spain, at least in Spain and in the whole of Europe, people, I mean, even kids are, are being vaccinated because kids have died, not as much surely than as old people, but also middle aged people and even youngsters and even kids have died because of COVID. Yeah, well, but very, very lesser. Less, um, yes, for sure, less. The number of people over 80 years old that have been vaccinated is 90% in America. And the people over 65, 75%. So if 75 to 90% have taken the vaccine and didn't die or nothing bad happened to them, then that sort of undercuts the whole conspiracy theory that there's something wrong with the vaccine. So they're really hurting people. So I don't see how the data supports that theory. Now, I'm not disagreeing that in many cases, a vaccine can cause bad symptoms. Mm -hmm. Side effects. And I, I know people that have had the vaccine and felt horrible for two weeks afterwards. And that is still a theory that medical people are trying to work out and mm -hmm. try to figure, okay, what happens? It doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to some people. So you have to at least take that into account. But the idea that 90% of the population has gotten vaccinated and virtually none of them die, that just sort of undercuts the whole anti-vax notion. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing it come up now, particularly with the 25% of the people that haven't gotten vaccinated. And then Joe Biden comes out with his idiotic vax mandates, which says you have to get a vaccine or you can't go to work, you can't go to school, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. That's it. And travel, we have to, even to go into a, a restaurant, we have to have a certificate that's that we right. have to present. That's right. And that's just, that's ridiculous. It is. Um, and I'm very much against that. Um, and that aggressive reaction is a large part of what's behind the anti-vax conspiracy theories. So I understand that, I do. But 
it it's not it doesn't really fully fit all of the data the way we have it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like mm -hmm. i say we 75 to 90 percent have been vaccinated mm -hmm. and don't die or don't have any horrible mm -hmm. effects mm -hmm. side um, of mm -hmm. yeah but the people that have not been vaccinated and are reacting to this idiotic vax mandate, that's the source of all sorts of theories and conspiracy theories and negative ideas because these people really don't want to get vaccinated. That's why the 25% or so that haven't been vaccinated, they didn't get vaccinated, vaccinated to begin with because they didn't believe in vaccines or they didn't want to get vaccinated or they thought that there was it would cause some sort of problems. Mm -hmm. And that's the source that a lot of the anti-vax conspiracy theories come from. And I can sympathize very much with their ideas, but I don't think they're worth taking that seriously. Okay. I see. So, um, you know, Alice Bailey wrote a real epistemology of awakening more to intuition than to rationality, inclined to scientism, scientificism, I don't know how you say that, yeah. scientism, as in your books. So would you call what she wrote esotericism? And in which degree are you aligned with the way in which it was introduced by her in our Western world? Yeah, I'm not familiar with her work. So I can only piece together what you said. Um, if you say it's a epistemology of awakening mm -hmm. uh, epistemology of enlightenment but mm -hmm. it works not on rational grounds but more on intuitive grounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well i would agree in that even though i have rationally laid out the stages of enlightenment and these stages are based on the stages given in the traditional literature and they're given on the stages of modern researchers like daniel p brown who gives five major stages of development and those five major stages are exactly the five that i give as gross, subtle, causal, turia, and turia, tina. So there's an abundant agreement uh, about all of those. But when we say I've laid out rationally what these stages are, the stages themselves aren't composed of rationality. They're composed of intuition. And that's what they mean. So stage one is stage one of intuition. And stage two is stage two of intuition. Stage three is stage three of intuition. Stage four is stage four of intuition. And stage five is stage five of intuition. So that's the actual way that I spell them out. Of course, I have to write about them. And so I tend to write about them in terms that make sense. 
So I'll write about them in rational or at least English terms and um, explain them that way. But what I'm explaining are states of intuition, not states of rationality. Mm -hmm. So, would you call that esotericism then? A what? Esotericism? Esotericism? Uh, esotericism? Yeah, esotericism. Would you sure. call that? Sure. Mm, good. Very clear. Sure. <laughs> so, knowledge is more and more accessible nowadays, as well as the spiritual practices. And having in mind that the integral theory talks about an evolutionary upward spiral, which are for you the reasons for such a violent duality in present stance and criteria, which are dividing humanity completely. Whenever we have more knowledge and we have integral theory and all that. So wouldn't you think that humanity should have already achieved a witness consciousness precisely because of the massive access to information and enactment? Well, I think that there are several reasons that humanity has not yet fully attained a witnessing state. And one of them is just what I was saying, these states of consciousness that I outlined in rational ways aren't themselves composed of rationality. They're composed of intuition. And so people have trouble in moving from rationality to intuition. And intuition is a very tricky thing. Um, it's hard to access because it is intuitive. It's not rational or verbal or any of those. And it, if you explain it in rational terms, you just usually get stories that are confusing to rationality. So like if you if you read any of the Zen stories talking about these higher stages, including the witness and non-duality and so on, they um, don't make rational sense. So they're called koans. And some koans, you can state them but they don't make rational sense. So for example, one koan is, show me your original face, the face you had before your parents were born. Or what's the sound of one hand clapping? And it, if you were at that stage and you had that intuition, it would make sense you'd know and you could actually answer what's the sound of one hand clapping. And in Zen, you simply extend your one hand and that's the answer. Um, when they say, show me your original face, the face you had before your parents were born, what they mean is that your true self, your original face, doesn't exist in time, it's timeless. And so being timeless, it's present at every point of time. And therefore it's gonna be present before your parents were born. Um, there's a goose in a bottle. 
without breaking the bottle, get the goose out. <laughs> That's another one. And so all of these are make sense if you're at an intuitive stage, but they don't make sense rationally. Mm -hmm. And they're very difficult to understand if you're just doing them rationally. As a matter of fact, you pretty much can't understand them if you're just doing them rationally. I mean, how do you get the goose out without breaking the bottle or hurting the goose? <laughs> right. So that's what makes it hard to move up from the first, say, two thirds of development, which more or less can be understood in rational terms. And then the upper third or so, which can't be understood. In and that's what makes it hard getting from rational stages to super rational or intuitive stages. And they are very, very difficult. Um, and most people have to meditate on them if they're doing zen mm -hmm. have to meditate as i said for two or three years before they'll actually crack through rational thinking and crack through into a true intuitive understanding and then they'll get exactly what show me your face the original face, the face you had before your parents were born. That's very easy to do from an intuitive level. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's impossible to do from a rational level. And so people have access to their witness more or less all the time. It's the thing in you right now which is aware of everything that's happening. So you witness the things around you, you witness your inner thoughts, you witness everything. everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the witness. Mm -hmm. But getting directly in touch with that as an intuitive reality, a sharp, clear, intuitive reality, that's difficult. So, but you'll recognize it when you do, and that's your original face. So when you really break into the pure witness, you'll understand what your original face was, the face you had before your parents were born. Because when you break into the witness in a full, body intuitive fashion then you become aware not just of the typical stuff you witness but you become aware of the witness itself and the fact that it's timeless it's eternal and so of course it exists prior to your parents birth it exists exists prior to the universe's existence it exists prior to the Big Bang. Just because it exists prior to time. No time. Yeah. In general, right. But that's a difficult transition. Yeah. And that's why humanity is not ready yet, it seems. It seems, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Do, do you think we will ever get there? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think there are growing numbers of people right now that are getting in touch with their witness. And then there's also a step beyond the witness, which is called Turiyatita or non-dual. And 
what happens there is that the witness, which is sort of a Zen master Shibayama calls it absolute subjectivity. In other words, it's the pure subject in you that sees all these objects. And the pure subject is identified with nothing. So it has a vast sense of freedom and release and awareness. And then the next step is that subjectivity itself dissolves. And right, you no longer witness the mountain, you are the mountain. You no longer see the sky, you are the sky. You no longer feel the earth, you are the earth. Right. Isn't and that that's the ultimate state? Mm -hmm. So we have at least those two higher states to go um, in terms of human development. And as I say, I know at least a fair number, not a lot, but a fair number of people that are witnessing. They're at the witness stage. You but, said 5%. You think we have gone over that? 5%? You said you said once 5%. Have, do you think we have gone over that after pandemic or not? What was the percentage again? Five percent. You said. I uh, yeah. Um, you still I, you. I would, I, would say, I would say around five percent. So we haven't changed it then. <laughs> we haven't gone up then from there. Oh, so the truth then finally is to, for what I I am listening is that. Uh, if we really want to go up those uh, path, that path um, to higher realms, and not only from the witness, from but from to to Riyatita, you know, non-dual and farther, it's it's only a, 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 an individual matter. It cannot be collectively achieved. Yeah, basically. Um... It is mostly individual and um, collective achievement is pretty rare. You see it something like it in communities that practice uh, Zen communities, for example, and they'll sometimes in a community setting for example this one person has a breakthrough to the witness you'll sometimes see two or three other people get a breakthrough fairly mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. it, it does have a, a, a sort of sharing capacity like Rupert Sheldrake will say, through morphogenetic fields. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. And yeah. That's fine. Mm hmm, mm hmm. But only in that case, yeah, I, I see. Well, if we, if we finally arrive to this community style consciousness, that it seems that this regenerating because it seems that we have passed now from the sustainability to the regenerative consciousness and it, in this regenerative consciousness it seems that the the idea of communities of thought and communities of consciousness uh, and communities of work it's more you know like um, uh, present and desirable and talk now it's being talked more about uh maybe in those communities if we really get to be and gather in communities then we may be able to make more of a collective uh awakening you know, and growing up <laughs> that's certainly possible 
I don't know, but it will be desirable at yeah. least. So it seems by your previous interview, Ken, about pandemic that you didn't leave aside any opposing roles like official, we could say, and critic. And which is your opinion now? I think that you have already answered this question because, you know, many <laughs> people were uh, interested in this. Do you think that both are contributing with partial truths? Would you explain some of its successes and errors? Have you thought about writing a book about the pandemic? Uh, I haven't thought about writing a book about the pandemic. Um, what was the other part of your question? I didn't quite yeah. get the first part. It's, it's like uh, that in, in your previous interview about pandemic, you didn't leave aside any op opposing roles like you you didn't kind of clarify yourself very much on what were you choosing what were you preparing no because do you think that both are contributing with partial truths is that what it happens why do you not because today i for what you have heard I think that you have really positioned yourself. You have taken a clear stand. But in other interviews, maybe you were not that clear on your stand about it. And uh, the, the, this person wanted to know if what it happens is that you are seeing partial truths in both sides. No? Yeah. Um, and in what interviews were this that I did this? I, I don't know, probably in, in the last uh, the last interview that we had, someone was asking about the pandemic and you probably talked, I don't remember now, but you probably didn't be, was, were, maybe you were not as clear as today you have been. And, uh, and then uh, someone was wanting you, was asking you to take a stand on it or or to at least explain why you were not taking a stand you know, on on it right and what does not taking a stand on it mean not taking a stand on it will be like not positioning yourself in i am official or i am anti-official you know I am pro vaccines or I am anti vaccines, you know. So this this person would like to know if you are seeing like partial truths in both positions and therefore that's why to take a, a clear stand will not be kind of advisable or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, as far as I understand it and I'm still having a little trouble understanding it, but um, as far as me taking a position either for the pandemic side or against it, I can almost certainly say that my response would have been partially for and partially against simply because I tend to find integral positions overlap all opposites. So um, one way to think of the integral approach is the way the Christian mystics viewed the world, which is what they called the coincidentia oppositorum which means the coincidence of opposites, which means the unity of opposites. And that's, of course, the same as the non-dual traditions the world over. So whenever you're particularly talking about relative truth, 
you're always presented with at least two opposites because all of our concepts make sense only in terms that they're opposite good versus evil pleasure versus pain up versus down in versus out good versus bad i mean they're all opposites and if you're trying to present a holistic view then you've got to find a way to include both of those opposites so that you can get a coincidential oppositorum. You can get a unity of opposites. So my generic response would be that if I was facing any pandemic versus pan non-pandemic or whatever, that I would have definitely not come down on one side or the other. Just like when I was talking about vaccines, I pointed out the parts of it that would be true and the parts of it that just wouldn't be true at all. So like I said, if 75 to 90 percent have taken the COVID vaccine and are still alive and nothing bad happened, that would go against the conspiracy theory. But then I said the 75% that are anti-vax and have never been vaccinated, they very likely didn't want to get vaccinated from the beginning. So they have an anti-vax prejudice. And that's where conspiracy theories tend to grow. Now, I said, I'm not denying that there can be some truth to that. But it's not going to be the sole truth. Because we have the other half of the story. And so that tends to be the way I think about anything. And it's always uh, partial difficult. truths, partial truths. No? Yeah. Yeah. And it's always going to be difficult to tease apart the opposites and look for the partial truth in each of them, as well as the partial falsehood in either of them. And that gives you a much more accurate, realistic view of what's really happening in the relative world, which is the world of Maya, which means the world of opposites the the lila no the game yeah. of the lila <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah uh, okay so the english psychoanalyst john bowlby father of the attachment theory in 1969 together with mary ainsworth 1978 and mary main 1995 accumulated huge clinical evidence about rela relational affective nexus and its importance in the human potentials development, leaving very clear also the negative effect that a toxic and disorganized linkage may have in mental health. So what's the space that all of this knowledge with its proven authentication has in integral theory? Um, attachment theory is very important. And it particularly traces its genesis in the first one or two years of life. And they have four or so major types of attachment theory and attachment disorder that can happen. And each one of these disorders 
has a whole series of psychological symptoms uh, addressed around it, caused by it. And this is what I call fulcrum, fulcrum one and fulcrum two. And I agree very strongly with almost all of that theory. Um, and there's um, a very well-known theorist on this named Daniel P. Brown. And he's just written a textbook about that thick on attachment theory. And he traces it through the early fulcrums. And then he continues, and I was struck by this, all the way into my higher stages of development, including up to enlightenment. Oh. Mm -hmm. So he gives a complete account of how attachment theory starts at the earlier fulcrums and how they can affect each subsequent fulcrum. And then he carries it into the three higher stages of development. So I'm fully in favor of that general theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And it's also some of the most recent theory that has been suggested mm -hmm. for that. I still think that some of the earlier work, uh, Margaret Mahler's work, for example, I still think those are very real and can't be discarded. But attachment theory is a very important aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Thank you. So um, let's see the Yugas, a two uh, twenty four thousand year cycle age, cyclic age, where the world cycles through four stages of evolution as explained in Hindu cosmology, have never appeared in your writings. Have they been considered for inclusion in integral theory? Do they make a case for aspects of aqual, such as the states of consciousness or spiritual and moral lines being subject to a cyclic nature of evolution? May orienting generalizations be drawn from the said yugas or Greek ages, precession of equinoxes and zodiac ages to benefit and expand integral? Well, to the extent it's based on Hindu cycles, generally speaking, what happens when we look at cycles of development is that the earlier we go back in history, the less useful we find those types of cycles to be applicable mm -hmm. simply because when we were first present on this human planet, the cycles tended to be just that, cycles. So the way our first theories of time were based on the natural seasons so spring to summer to fall to winter right back to spring summer fall and winter right back to spring and summer and fall and winter the kali yugas uh, and the sense of yugas follow the same kind of circular cyclical approach. It wasn't until 1500 or so 
that we started to break open those cycles and realize that they had a historical linear mode. And so we could start following those outward. And those tended to then give us, the more we looked at those, the more we looked at the earlier stages and saw them as being very primitive. And well, that, there's no nice way to say it, just fairly primitive and early. And then as we kept going, we'd go through early pre-temporal periods, like zero to 300 AD. And then we'd slowly see them stretch into 400, 500, 600, 700 AD, and then into the Middle Ages. And by that time, we have a sense of actual history and per progress occur. And then from Middle Ages into modern ages, then into postmodern ages, then coming up on an integral age. And those showed development. And it was also during that period that we discovered evolution, particularly the German idealists discovered it. Darwin, who was a friend of Schelling, applied the evolutionary theory to biology. Mm -hmm. for example. And others applied it to other aspects of nature. Um, and so we got, we moved from cyclical periods of time to progressive and historical movements of time. And those have just proven to be more telling. Because during cyclical time, there was almost no progress at all. Things just went round and round and round. And for the first 300,000 years that we were on this earth, there was absolutely nothing but cyclical time. You just, the early tribal people just went from one season to the next to the next back around and around and around and around and they saw things going nowhere mm -hmm. so we went on like that for a long time and then it started sort of breaking out a little bit and then breaking out more until we moved into linear historical progressive time and that's what we looked at now and when we think about previous time we now almost entirely think about it in terms of previous stages of evolution in other words stages of this linear progressive time and so when we look back on those early 300,000 years we don't think of them as just going in circles. We think of them in terms of the earliest of our ancestors during evolution. And so the yugas and various cycles, um, they're useful in a sort of not very useful sense, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of something that I would want to base like a theory on, they're not something that works very good. No, I think that um, as far as I have read your works, you talk about this in several of your books. You talk about 
evolution and progress and how it has been like developing from the origins up to now. So it's not something that you have not touched about. I think sure. you, you have talked about this. Probably the, this person that asked this has not read some of the books in which you talk about this. So yeah. I invite them to read them all. Yeah. Um, so why haven't you a, ever debated about any of your critics? Why haven't I? Why haven't you ever debated or talked about your critics, the people that critic you? Why don't you ever answer critics and people that make critics of yours? Oh, I have, well, first of all, I have gotten in debates with various people on occasion. They don't usually get a lot of attention because they're just done with just a few people. And we just talk about very specific topics. But I made a decision when I first started writing that whenever a book would come out, there was usually such a huge response. And a lot of it was very good. And a lot of it was bad, as you can understand, or critical. And I attempted to answer them in the first year or two. But then I just started to realize this is taking forever. And I'm never going to, I can spend my time defending what I wrote yesterday, or I can write something new today. And I decided I wanted to write something new today. So I, from that time forward, I've never answered critics in terms of written responses. I've never gone to a conference where my work was discussed and yeah. I, I just didn't feel that the time was worth it. I, I would call that you are on the go and that's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found that by the time all this criticism and positive stuff was coming, that I was by that time writing a book a year. And I just did not have time to get engaged in all of these discussions. Right, right. I understand it very well. It's, I flow, I flow with whatever it's in front of me, not what I have done already. Yeah, I, I understand. Thank you. Um, in your book, the religion of tomorrow, you say that kingdoms are ontological and states epistemological. At the Wilbur Combs lattice, only states appear, those quadrants of the left hand, not kingdoms, quadrants of the right hand, body, mass, energies. Our question is then, from which raw material, energy, are the Svabas bikakaya bodies or empty witness made of. And the same about Bahrakaya or body of the non-dual consciousness. If you say that there are only three kingdoms, ordinary, subtle, and causal, couldn't it be that Svaba Bikakaya and Bahrakaya are only metaphors without ontological entity? I didn't catch most of that. Was the was the last one something about? Let's see. Uh, uh, Savatkaya, uh, Dharmakaya. In your book, The Religion of Tomorrow, you say that kingdoms are ontological 
and states epistemological. Of the Wilbur Combs lattice, only states appear. Those quadrants of the left hand, not kingdoms, which will be the quadrants of the right hand. Our question is then, from which raw material or energy are the svavavikakaya bodies or empty witness made of? And also, of what energy or raw material are the vakrakaya or body of the non-dual consciousness made of? Okay, I'm still not sure I fully understand that, but because they say they they add that if you say that there are only three kingdoms, ordinary, subtle, and causal, couldn't it be that this svava, vikakaya, and vahrakaya are only metaphors? without any ontological entity? Well, again, if I understand this correctly, I wouldn't say they're just metaphorical. Um, they are made of the stuff of the higher dimensions of consciousness. So particularly Nirmanakaya, Subhavikakaya, Dharmakaya, and well, integral Kaya or Vajrakaya, those are actually the substance of consciousness that you recognize when you reach those specific kayas. Mm -hmm. um, and so as for empires, um, I'm not sure I understand what sense they mean that. I don't either because these questions are made by you know Alejandro Villar? Okay, it's a guy, it's the guy in Spain that um, intellectually, intellectually knows more of integral. Yeah. But then he's a meditator himself, and then he knows a lot about levels right. on the higher realms let's say right. and uh, and therefore uh him and the other guy which uh, i don't remember now they are they have gotten together and they were discussing about this and uh, they always have some kind of uh, you know let's see who knows more about these higher levels <laughs> and i don't know but uh, i don't understand even their question because i don't know about what they're talking about so well, I, I would say that those higher more. levels are made of the stuff that those higher stages of consciousness are made of and that's why they're actually given the names like nirmana kaya or samboga kaya or dharma kaya kaya actually means body so it means a real substance a real body so nirmana kaya is the body made out of the nirmana kaya level of consciousness and the samboga kaya is a kaya a actual body that's constructed out of the higher stage of the swabhavi nature and dharma kaya dharma generally is taken to mean emptiness in this occasion and 
the kaya is the body made out of emptiness. And the <clears throat> Vajra Kaya is the body made out of Vajra, which in this case means the substance that integrates all of the previous Kayas. But Kaya is a real stuff. It's a real substance. That's so, why you said he's not metaphorical, but he's a real kaya, a real body. Right. Right. I think that that answer is, is enough because I think that's what they wanted to know. If okay. there was a real body in itself, a real stuff, like you call right. it. Yeah, good. Good. So the last question, Ken, it's, Talking about stages of development, it's disgusting, this idea of having to go up a spiral as high as possible through levels. I hear this idea on everyone that starts to learn about integral, and it sounds to me as a curse. You are red, you are blue. What happens if this idea becomes, becomes a government ideology? Will We'll have a turquoise elite on a purple scum crowd. The very idea of levels is corrupted. There is no such a thing as people on levels. It's more likely that there is something we call levels acting through people. So what other ways may we use to talk about the stages of development instead of the metaphors of the levels? Since 215, we've been using another one to explain the spiral evolution through music with growing complexity because people are music. So this is, this is talked or asked by a Russian integralist. Yeah. Um, well, um, if you look at accepted models of development, whether it's Piaget's or Kohlberg's or Levenger's or Maslow's. In a book, Integral Psychology, I include charts of a hundred different developmental models. All of them present stages of development. So if you look at Piaget, what you find as you start following human growth and development is that humans start out and in the first six to 12 months of life, they can't do mathematics. They can't even read English. They can't do any of these things. And what happens they can't even figure out that if you have a ball and you hide it behind a pillow, it doesn't simply disappear from existence. That understanding comes about with sensory motor intelligence mm -hmm. in the first year or two of life. Mm -hmm. So once that develops and they have an object constancy, then they move into pre-operational cognition. And here they can use concepts and words and so on. And that ends up, well, that's a model that continues to unfold in what can be called levels of development. Now, by levels, nobody means something rigid, strict, and like rungs in a ladder. That's not what it means. 
What it means is that if you're at a level that there's a certain type of capacity that you can create at that level. So as people move from pre-operational thinking to concrete operational thinking, what that means is that they can concretely operate on the world. So they can perform multiplication, addition, division, subtraction, and so on, and come up with concrete operations on the real world around them. And that's a very clear degree of development, increase capacity. Then when they get to adolescence, they can generally start to create a capacity called formal operational thinking. And where concrete operational is thinking operating on the world, formal operational is thinking operating on concrete operational thinking. So people can start to think things like algebra and variables and x equals and stuff like that. Equation. And also form a third person perspective. Concrete operational forms a second person perspective. Pre-operational, a first person perspective. But by the time they get to formal operational, they can take a third person perspective. And that means they can conceive universal entities. And that is extremely important. It was the emergence of formal operational thinking, for example, that only about 200 years ago did it emerge. And when it did, slavery was present in every culture the world over. Even mm -hmm. though people had concrete operational thinking, they couldn't conceive a third person or a universal standard. And so when they moved to formal operational cognition and third person capacities, then in a 100 year period from 1785 to 1885, slavery was outlawed in every rational industrial nation on the planet. The first time anything like that had ever happened. Mm -hmm. And so that represents an enormous growth in consciousness. Yeah, but, but what, excuse me again, but what this guy is asking is if there is another way to call levels, because he yeah. it, seems, it seems he doesn't like the word levels because it seems that it's um, like making the people like if they are things instead yeah. of recognizing well, the whole person. Yeah, levels is a green anathema term. People at green hate levels and they'll do anything to stop levels because levels seem like hierarchy. Hierarchy, yeah. Of course they are, but so is every major growth stage. There you go. The hierarchy. Right. And right. so that's just something, if you're green, you're just going to have to <laughs> swallow it. And just get used to it. But levels are problematic, and I've frequently written about this. I'll say we have to understand that levels aren't like rungs in a ladder, that they don't just show up discreetly. 
and you step up from one to another to another. And so I frequently, instead of levels and lines, I use the phrase waves and streams because that gives a better sense of the looseness of what's happening. But nevertheless, in theory, we can see levels of development occurring throughout these waves and streams. So that's important to realize that. And of the 100 models that I gave in integral psychology and the charts I gave of all 100 of them, all 100 of them had levels, levels. of existence. Absolutely. Right. The so, developmental uh, way to, to grow. Right. Yeah. Right. But I've always been careful again to introduce waves and streams instead of levels and lines. Because levels and lines are just, even though they're the bet noir of green, they also are just a little too rigid mm -hmm. in terms of what they're actually doing. Because again, they're not rungs on a ladder or anything like that. But in terms of just abstract understanding of what is happening with a level, because we can say formal operational is a level beyond concrete operational, which is a level beyond pre-operational, which is a level beyond sensory motor. And we know what that means. So um, <laughs> there's always terminology problems. And one of the biggest terminology problems I've had is getting from green to integral. Mm. Because green, first of all, it's getting over formal operational. So there's a lot more looseness to it. And it hates any terms like hierarchy and level and all of these. So these have been very, very difficult terms for me to deal with. Yeah. It's but it's a wonderful way to end up our interview because it you know it gives the consciousness of right. where we are in the in the world right now with this lead of the green, you know, that until we don't get up the lead, you know, everything is cooking inside, but nothing, there is no steam coming up. Right. So, you know, it seems we have to explode sometime to, right. to really go over all this. So thank you very much. It's wonderful to see that you are my most integral man in the world. <laughs> Thank you. I do appreciate it, my dear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend. You are a lovely, lovely person. And I thank you very, very much. Bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, dear. Bye. Thanks a lot.